All right, guys, welcome back to a few more chapters of Island of the Blue Dolphins. Today we're going to start by reading chapter 8. Uh, let's remember what's happened so far. You remember that Karana's father and many other people on the island were killed when the Aleuts, led by Captain Orlov, a Russian with blonde hair, had shown up on the island to hunt. Now, as they killed those people, they also left, and the whole island was so afraid for about a year until finally their new chief found them a new place to live. So in the last chapter, we saw that he came back with some white sailors who were going to help all the people leave Galasat and go to a new island. But Karana realized that her little brother, Ramo had stayed behind for his fishing spear. So she jumped out of the boat and went back to be with him, but ruined some of her stuff in the process. So let's get back with Karana. The wind blew strong as we climbed the trail, covering the mesa with sand that sifted around our legs and shut out the sky. Since it was not possible to find our way back, we took shelter among some rocks. We stayed there until night fell, and then the wind lessened, and the moon had come out, and by its light we reached the village. The huts looked like ghosts in the cold light. As we neared them, I heard a strange sound like that of running feet. I thought that it was a sound made by the wind, but when we came closer, I saw dozens of wild dogs scurrying around through the huts. They ran from us, snarling as they went. The pack must have slunk into the village soon after we left, for it had gorged itself upon the abalone we had not taken. It had gone everywhere searching out food, and Ramo and I had to look hard to find enough for our supper. While we ate beside a small fire, I could hear the dogs on the hill not far away, and through the night their howls came to me on the wind. But when the sun rose, I went out of the hut, and the pack trotted off towards its lair, which was at the north side of the island in a large cave. That day we spent gathering food. The wind blew, and the waves crashed against the shore so that we could not go out on the rocks. I gathered gull eggs on the cliff, and Ramo speared a string of small fish in one of the tide pools. He brought them home, walking proudly with the string over his back. He felt that in this way he had made up for the trouble he had caused. With the seeds I had gathered in a ravine, we had a plentiful meal, although I had to cook it on a flat rock. My bowls were at the bottom of the sea. The wild dogs came again that night, drawn by the scent of fish. They sat on the hill barking and growling at each other. I could see the light from the fire shining in their eyes, and at dawn they left. The ocean was calm on this day, and we were able to hunt abalone among the rocks. From seaweed, we wove a rough basket, which we filled before the sun was overhead. On the way home, carrying the abalone between us, Ramo and I stopped on the cliff. The air was clear, and we could look far out to sea in the direction the ship had gone. Will it come back today? Ramo asked. It may, I answered him, though I did not think so. More likely, it will come after many suns, for the country where it has gone is far off. Ramo looked up at me. His black eyes shone. I do not care if the ship never comes, he said. Why do you say this? I asked him. Ramo thought, making a hole in the earth with the point of his spear. Why? I asked again. Because I like it here with you he said. It is more fun than when the others were here. Tomorrow I'm going to go where the canoes are hidden and bring one back to Coral Cove. We will use it to fish in and to go looking around the island. Well, they are too heavy for you to put into the water. You will see. Ramo threw out his chest. Around his neck was a string of sea elephant teeth, which someone had left behind. It was much too large for him, and the teeth were broken, but they rattled as he thrust the spear down between us. You forget that I am the son of Choig, he said. I do not forget, I answered, but you are a small son. Someday you will be tall and strong, and then you will be able to handle a big canoe. I am the son of Choig, he said again, and as he spoke, his eyes suddenly grew large. I am his son, and since he is dead, I have taken his place. I am now chief of Galasat. All my wishes must be obeyed. But first you must become a man, as is the custom. Therefore, I will have to whip you with a switch of nettles and then tie you to a red anthill. Ramo grew pale. 
He had seen the rights of manhood given in our tribe and remembered them. Quickly, I said, Well, since there are no men to give the rights, perhaps you will not have to undergo the nettles and the ants, Chief Ramo. I do not know if this name suits me, he said, smiling. He tossed his spear at a passing gull. I will think of something better. I watched him stride off to get the spear, a little boy with thin arms and legs like sticks, wearing a big string of sea elephant teeth. Now that he had become chief of Galasad, I would have even more trouble with him, but I wanted to run after him and take him in my arms. I have thought of a name, he said when he came back. What is it? I asked solemnly. I am Chief Tenisotiplau. Well, that is a very long name and hard to say. Well, you will soon learn, Chief Tenisotopla said. I had no thought of letting Chief Tenisotopla go alone to the place where the canoes were hidden. But the next morning when I awoke, I found that Ramo was not in the hut. He was not outside either. And I knew then that he had gotten up in the dark and left by himself. I was frightened. I thought of all that might befall him. He had climbed down the kelp rope once before, but he would have trouble pushing even the smallest of the canoes off the rocks. And if he did get one afloat without hurting himself, would he be able to paddle around the sand spit where the tides ran fast? Thinking of these dangers, I started off to overtake him. I had not gone far along the trail before I began to wonder if I should not let him go to the cliff by himself. There was no way of telling him when the ship would come back for us. Until it did, we were alone upon the island. Ramo, therefore, would have to become a man sooner than if we were not alone, since I would need his help in many ways. Suddenly, I turned around and took the trail toward Coral Cove. If Ramo could put the canoe in the water and get through the tides that traced around the sand spit, he would reach the harbor when the sun was tall in the sky. I would be waiting on the beach, for what was the fun of a voyage if one were there to if one were there to greet him, if no one were there to greet him. I put Ramo out of my mind as I searched the rocks for mussels. I thought of the food that we would need to gather and how to best protect it from the wild dogs when we were not in the village. I thought also I thought also of the ship. I tried to remember what Matasayup had said to me. For the first time I began to wonder if the ship would ever return. I wondered about this as I pried the shells off the rocks and I would stop and look fearfully at the empty sea that stretched away farther than my eyes could reach. The sun moved higher. There was no sign of Ramo. I began to feel uneasy. The basket was filled, and I carried it up to the mesa. From here I looked down on the harbor and farther on along the coast to the spit that thrust out like a fish hook into the sea. I could see the small waves sliding up the sand, and beyond them a curving line of foam where the currents raced. I waited on the mesa until the sun was overhead, and then I hurried back to the village, hoping that Ramo might have come back while I was gone. The hut was empty. Quickly I dug a hole for the shellfish, rolled a heavy stone over the opening to protect them from the wild dogs, and started off towards the south part of the island. Two trails led there, one on each side of a long sand dune. Ramo was not on the trail that I was traveling, and thinking that he might be coming back, out of sight, along the other one. I called to him as I ran. I heard no one answer, but I did hear far off the barking of dogs. The barking grew louder as I came closer to the cliff. It would die away and after a short silence start up again. The sound came from the opposite side of the dunes, and leaving the trail I climbed upward through the sand to its top. A short distance beyond the dune, near the cliff, I saw the pack of wild dogs. There were many of them, and they were moving around in a circle, and in the middle of the circle was Ramo. He was lying on his back, and he had a deep wound in his throat. He lay very still. When I picked him up, I knew that he was dead. There were other wounds on his body from the teeth of the wild dogs. He had been dead a long time, and from his footsteps on the earth, I could see that he had never reached the cliff. Two dogs lay on the ground not far from him, and in the side of one of them was his broken spear. I carried Ramo back to the village, reaching it when the sun was far down. The dogs followed me all the way, but when I had laid him down in the hut and it came out with a club in my hand, they trotted off to a low hill. A big gray dog with long curling hair and yellow eyes was their leader, and he went last. It was growling dark, and it was growing dark, but I followed them up the hill. Slowly, they retreated in front of me. Not making a sound, I followed them across two hills 
and a small valley to a third hill, whose face was a ledge of rock. At one end of the ledge was a cave. One by one, the dogs went into it. The mouth of the cave was too wide, and the hill to fill with rocks. I gathered brush, and I made a fire, thinking that I would push it back into the cave. Through the night, I would feed it and push it farther and farther back, but there was not enough brush for this. When the moon rose, I left the cave and went off through the valley and over the three hills to my home. All night, I sat there with the body of my brother and did not sleep. I vowed that someday I would go back and I would kill the wild dogs in the cave. I would kill all of them. I thought of how I would do it, but mostly I thought of Ramo, my brother. Chapter 9 I do not remember much of this time except that many suns rose and set. I thought about what I was going to do now that I was alone. I did not leave the village, not until I had eaten all the abalones did I leave, and then only to gather more. Yet I do remember the day that I decided I would never live in the village again. It was a morning of thick fog and the sound of far-off waves breaking on the shore. I had never noticed before how silent the village was. Fog crept in and out of the empty huts, and it made shapes as it drifted, and they reminded me of all the people who were dead and those who were gone. The noise of the surf seemed to be their voices speaking. I sat for a long time, seeing those shapes and hearing the voices until the sun came out and the fog vanished. And then I made a fire against the wall of the house. When it was in burn, when it was burned to the earth, I started a fire in another house. Thus, one by one, I destroyed them all so that there was only ashes left to mark the village of Galasat. There was nothing to take away with me except a basket of food. I therefore traveled fast, and before night fell, I reached the place where I had decided to live until the ship returned. This place lay on the headland, a half-league to the west of Coral Cove. There was a large rock, and that headland, and two stunted trees. Behind the rock was a clear place, about ten steps across, which was sheltered from the wind, from which I could see the harbor and the ocean. A spring of water flowed from the ravine nearby. That night, I climbed on the rock to sleep. It was flat on top and wide enough for me to stretch out. Also, it was high enough from the ground that I did not need to fear the wild dogs while I was sleeping. I had not seen them again since the day that they had killed Ramo, but I was sure that they would come soon to my new camp. The rock was also a safe place to store the food that I had brought with me and everything that I would gather. Since it was still winter and any day the ship might return, there was no use to store the food I would not need. This gave me time to make weapons to protect myself from the dogs, which I felt would sometime attack me to kill them all, one by one. I had a club that I found in one of the huts, but I needed a bow and arrows and a large spear. The spear which I had taken from the slain dog was too small. It was good for spearing fish and little else. The laws of Galsat forbade the making of weapons by women of the tribe, so I went out to search for any that may have been left behind. I went first to where the village had been, and I sifted the ashes for spearheads, and then, finding none, to the place where the canoes were hidden, believing that weapons might have been stored there with the food and water. I found nothing in the canoes under the cliff, and then remembering the chest the Aleuts had brought to the shore, I set out for Coral Cove. I had seen that chest on the beach during the battle, but I did not remember that the hunters had taken it with them when they fled. The beach was empty except for the rows of seaweed, washed in by the storm. The tide was out, and I looked in the place where the chest had lain. It was just below the ledge Alupe and I had stood on while we watched the battle. The sun was smooth, and I dug many small holes with a stick. I dug in with a wide circle, thinking that the storm might have covered it with sand. Near the center of the circle, the stick hit something hard, which I was sure was a rock, but as I dug deeper with my hands, I saw that it was the black lid of the chest. All morning I worked, Moving the sand away, the chest lay deep from the washing of the waves, and I did not try to dig it up, but only so I could raise the lid. As the sun rose high, the tide came rushing up the beach and filled the hole with sand. Each wave covered the chest deeper until it was completely hidden. I stood on the place, bracing myself against the waves so that I would not have to look for it again. When the tide turned, I began to dig with my feet, working them down and down and then with my hands. The chest was filled with beads and bracelets and earrings and many colors. I forgot about the spearheads that I had come for. I held each of the trinkets to the sun, turning them so that they caught the light. I put on the longest string of beads, which were blue, 
and a pair of blue bracelets, which exactly fitted my wrists, and I walked down the shore admiring myself. I walked the whole length of the shore of the cove. The beads and the bracelets made tinkling sounds. I felt like the bride of a chief as I walked there by the waves. I came to the foot of the trail where the battle had been fought, and suddenly I remembered those who had died there, and the men who had brought the jewels I was wearing. I went back to the chest, and for a long time I stood beside it, looking at the bracelets and the beads hanging from my neck, so beautiful and bright in the sun. They did not belong to the Aleuts, I said. They belonged to me. But even as I said this, I knew that I never could wear them. One by one, I took them off. I also took the rest of the beads from the chest, and then I walked through the waves and flung them all far away out into the deep water. There were no iron spearheads in the chest. I closed the lid, and I covered it with sand. I looked along the bottom of the trail, but finding nothing there I could use, I gave up my search. For many days, I did not think of the weapons again. Not until the wild dogs came one night and sat under the rock and howled. They were gone at daylight, but not far. During the day, I could see them slinking through the brush, watching me. That night, they came back to the headland. I had buried what was left of my supper, but they dug it up snarling and fighting amongst themselves over the scraps, and then they began to pace back and forth at the foot of the rock, sniffing the air, for they could smell my tracks and knew that I was somewhere near. For a long time I lay on the rock while they trotted around below me. The rock was high and they could not climb it, but I was still fearful. As I lay there, I wondered what would happen to me if I went against the law of our tribe, which forbade the making of weapons by women. If I did not think of it at all, and made those things which I must have to which I must have to protect myself. Would the four winds blow in from the four directions of the world and smother me as I made the weapons? Or would the earth tremble, as many said, and bury me beneath its falling rocks? Or as others said, would the sea rise over the island in a terrible flood? Would the weapons break in my hand at the moment when my life was in danger? Which is what my father had said. I thought about these things for two days, and on the third night, when the wild dogs returned to the rock, I made up my mind that no matter what befell me, I would make the weapons. In the morning, I set about it, though I felt very fearful. I wished to use a sea elephant's tusk for the tip of the spear because it's hard and of the right shape. There were many of these animals on the shore near my camp, but I lacked a weapon which was which to kill one. Our men usually hunted them with a strong net made of bull kelp which they threw over an animal while it slept. To do this, at least three men were needed, and even then the sea elephant often dragged the net into the sea and got away. I used instead the root of a tree, which I shaped into a point and hardened with fire, and this I bound to a long shaft with the green sinews of a seal that I killed with a rock. The bow and arrows took me more time and caused me great difficulty. I had a bowstring, but wood, which could be bent and yet had the proper strength, was not easy to, fu to find. I searched the ravines for several days before I found it, trees being very scarce on the island of the blue dolphins. Wood for the arrows was easier to find, and also the stone for the tips and the feathers for the ends of the shafts. Gathering these things was not the most trouble. I had seen the weapons made, but I knew little about it. I had seen my father sitting in the hut on winter nights, scraping the wood for shafts, chipping the stones for the tips, and tying the feathers. Yet I had watched him and really seen nothing. I had watched, but not with the eye of one who would ever do it. For this reason, I took many days and had many failures before I fashioned a bow and arrows that could be used. Wherever I went now, whether to the shore when I gathered shellfish or to the ravine for water, I carried this weapon in a sling on my back. I practiced with it and also with a spear. The dogs did not come to the camp during this time that I was making the weapons though every night I could hear them howling. Once, after the weapons were made, I saw the leader of the pack, the one with the gray hair and the yellow eyes, watching me from the brush. I had gone to the ravine for water, and he stood on the hill above the spring, looking down at me. He stood very quiet, with only his head showing over the top of a challah bush. He was too far away from me to reach him with an arrow. Wherever I went during the day, I felt secure with my new weapons, and I waited patiently for the time when I could use them against the wild dogs that had killed Ramo. I did not go to the cave where they had their lair, since I was sure that they would soon come to the camp, yet every night I climbed out of the rocks to sleep. After the first night I spent there, which was uncomfortable because of the uneven places in the rock, 
I carried dry seaweed up from the beach and made a bed for myself. It was a pleasant place to stay there on the headland. The stars were bright overhead, and I lay and I counted the ones that I knew, and I gave names to many that I did not know. And in the morning, the gulls flew out from their nests in the crevices of the cliff. They circled down to the tide pools where they stood first on one leg and then on the other, splashing water over themselves and combing their feathers with their curved beaks. And then they flew off down the shore to look for food. Beyond the kelp beds, pelicans were already hunting, soaring high over the clear water, <clears throat> diving straight down. <clears throat> Excuse me. If they sighted a fish to strike the sea with a great splash that I could hear. I also watched the otter hunting in the kelp. These shy little animals had come back soon after the elutes had left, and now there seemed to be as many of them as before. The early morning sun shone like gold, and their glossy pelts. Yet as I lay there on the high rock, looking at the stars, I thought about the ship which belonged to the white men, <clears throat> and at dawn, as light passed across the sea, my first glance was toward the little harbor of Coral Cove. Every morning, I would look for the ship there, thinking that it might have come in the night, and each morning, I would see nothing except the birds flying over the sea. When there were people in Galasad, I, I was always up before the sun and busy with many things, but now there was little to do. I did not leave the rock until the sun was high, and I would eat and then go to the spring and take a bath in the warm water. Afterwards, I went down to the shore where I could gather a few abalones and sometimes a spear and sometimes spear a fish for my supper. Before darkness fell, I climbed onto the rock and I watched the sea until it slowly disappeared into the night. The ship did not come, and thus winter passed and the spring. Chapter 10. Summer is the best time on the island of the Blue Dolphins. The sun is warm then, and the winds blow milder out of the west, sometimes out of the south. It was during these days that the ship might return, and now I spent most of my time on the rock, looking out from the high headland into the east, toward the country where my people had gone, across the sea that was never-ending. Once while I was watching us, I was, saw a small object, which I took to be the ship, but a stream of water rose from it, and I knew that it was a whale spouting. During those summer days, I saw nothing else. The first storm of winter ended my hopes. If the white men's ship were coming for me, it would have come during the time of good weather. Now, I would have to wait until winter was gone, maybe longer. The thought of being alone on the island, while so many, so many suns rose from the sea and went slowly back into the sea, filled my heart with loneliness. I had not felt so lonely before because I was sure the ship would return as Matasep said it would. Now, my hopes were dead. Now, I was really alone. I could not eat much, nor could I sleep without dreaming terrible dreams. The storm blew out of the north, sending big waves against the island, and winds so strong that I was unable to stay on the rock. I moved my bed to the foot of the rock, and for protection kept a fire going throughout the night. I slept there five times. The first night, the dogs came and stood outside the ring made by the fire. I killed three of them with arrows, but not the leader, and they did not come again. On the sixth day, when the storm had ended, I went to the place where the canoes had been hidden, and I let myself down over the cliff. This part of the shore was sheltered from the wind, and I found the canoes just as they had been left. The dried food was still good, but the water was stale, so I went back to the spring and I filled a fresh basket. I decided during these days of the storm, when I had given up hope of seeing the ship, that I would take one of the canoes and go to the country that lay towards the east. I remembered how Kimki, before he had gone, had asked the advice of his ancestors, who had lived many ages in the past, who had come to the island from that country, and likewise the advice of Zuma, the medicine man who had held power over the wind and the seas. But these things I could not do, for Zuma had been killed by the Aleuts, and in all my life I had never been able to speak with, my, with the dead, though many times I had tried. Yet I cannot say that I was really afraid as I stood there on the shore. I knew that my ancestors had crossed the sea, and in their canoes, coming from that place which lay beyond, King Ki too had crossed the sea. I was not nearly so skilled with the canoe as these men, but I must say that whatever might befall me on the endless waters did not trouble me. It meant far less than the thought of staying on the island alone, without a home or companions, pursued by the wild dogs, where everything reminded me of those who were dead and those who had gone away. 
Of the four canoes stored there against the cliff, I chose the smallest, which was still very heavy because it could carry six people. The task that faced me was to push it down the rocky shore and into the water, a distance four or five times its length. This I did by first removing all the large rocks in the front of the canoe. I then filled in all those holds with pebbles, and along this path laid down long strips of kelp making a slippery bed. The shore was steep, and once I got the canoe to move with its own weight, it slid down the path and into the water. The sun was in the west when I left the shore. The sea was calm behind the high cliffs. Using the two-bladed paddle, I quickly skirted the south part of the island. As I reached the sand spit, the wind struck. I was paddling from the back of the canoe because you can go faster kneeling there, but I could not handle it in the wind. Kneeling in the middle of the canoe, I paddled hard and did not pause until I had gone through the tides that run fast around the sand spit. There were many small waves, and I was soon wet. But as I come out from behind the spit, the spray lessened and the waves grew long and rolling. Though it would have been easier to go the way that they slanted, this would have taken me in the wrong direction. Therefore, I kept them on my left hand, as well as the island, which grew smaller and smaller behind me. At dusk, I looked back. The island of the Blue Dolphins had disappeared. This was the first time that I felt afraid. There were only hills and valleys of the waters around me now. When I was in the valley, I could see nothing, and when the canoe rose out of it, only the ocean stretching away and away. Night fell, and I drank from the basket. The water cooled my throat. The sea was black, and there was no difference between it and the sky. The waves made no sound among themselves, only faint noises as they went under the canoe and struck against it. Sometimes the noises seemed angry, and at other times, like people laughing, I was not hungry because of my fear. The first star made me feel less afraid. It came out low in the sky, and it was in front of me, towards the east. Other stars began to appear all around, but it was this one I kept my gaze upon. It was in the figure that we call a serpent, a star which shone green and which I knew. Now and then it was hidden by mist, yet it always came out brightly again. Without this star, I would have been lost, for the waves never changed. They came always from the same direction and in the manner that kept pushing me away from the place I wanted to reach. For this reason, the canoe made a path in the black water like a snake. But somehow, I kept moving towards the star which shone in the east. This star rose high, and then I kept the north star on my left hand, and the one we call the star that does not move. The wind grew quiet. Since it always died down when the night was half over, I knew how long I had been traveling and how far away the dawn was. About the time that I found that the canoe was leaking, about that time, I found that the canoe was leaking. Before dark, I had emptied one of the baskets in which food was stored and used it to dip out the water that came over the sides. The water that now moved around my knees was not from the waves. I stopped paddling and worked with the basket until the bottom of the canoe was almost dry, and then I searched around, feeling in the dark along the smooth planks, and found the place near the bow where the water was seeping through a crack as long as my hand and the width of a finger. Most of the time it was out of the sea, but it leaked whenever the canoe dipped forward in the waves. The places between the planks were filled with black pitch, which we gather along the shore. Lacking this, I tore a piece of fiber from my skirt and I pressed it into the crack, which held back the water. Dawn broke in a clear sky, and as the sun came out of the waves, I saw that it was far off on my left. During the night, I had drifted south of the place I wished to go, so I changed my direction and I paddled along the path made by the rising sun. There was no wind on this morning, and on the long waves went quietly under the canoe. I therefore moved faster than during the night. I was very tired, but more hopeful than I had been since I left the island. If the good weather did not change, I would cover many leagues before the dark. Another night and another day might bring me within sight of the shore towards which I was going. Not long after the dawn, while I was thinking of the strange place and what it could look like, the canoe began to leak again. This crack was between the same planks, but it was a larger one and close to where I was kneeling. The fiber I tore from my skirt and pushed into the crack held back most of the water, which seeped in whenever the canoe rose and fell with the waves. Yet I could see that the planks were weak from one end to the other probably from the canoe being stored so long in the sun, and that they might open along their whole length if the waves grew rougher. 
It was suddenly clear to me that it was dangerous to go on. The voyage would take two more days, perhaps longer. By turning back to the island, I would not have nearly so far to travel. Still, I could not make up my mind to do so. The sea was calm, and I had come far. The thought of turning back after all this labor was more than I could bear. Even greater was the thought of the deserted island that I would return to, of living there alone and forgotten. For how many suns and how many moons? The canoe drifted idly on the calm sea while these thoughts went over and over in my mind. But when I saw the water seeping through the crack again, I picked up the paddle. There was no choice except to turn back towards the island. I knew that only by the best of fortune would I ever reach it. The wind did not blow until the sun was overhead. Before that time, I was I'd covered a good distance, pausing only when it was necessary to dip water from the canoe. With the wind, I went more slowly and had to stop more often because of the water spilling over the sides. But the leak did not grow worse. This was my first good fortune. The next was when a swarm of dolphins appeared. They came swimming out of the west, but as they saw the canoe, they turned around in a great circle and began to follow me. They swam up slowly and so close that I could see their eyes, which are large and the color of the ocean. Then they swam on ahead of the canoe, crossing back and forth in front of it, diving in and out as if they were weaving a piece of cloth with their broad snouts. Dolphins are animals of good omen. It made me happy to have them swimming around the canoe, and though my hands had begun to bleed from the chafing of the paddle, just watching them made me forget the pain. I was very lonely before they appeared, but now I felt that I had friends with me, and I did not feel the same. The blue dolphins left me shortly before dusk. They left as quickly as they had come, going on into the west, but for a long time I could see the last of the sun shining on them. After night fell, I could still see them in my thoughts, and it was because of this that I kept on paddling when I wanted to lie down and sleep. More than anything, it was the blue dolphins that took me back home. Fog came with the night, yet from time to time I could see the star that stands high in the west, and the red star called Maggot, which is part of the figure that looks like a crawfish and is known by that name. The crack in the planks grew wider, so I had to stop often to fill it with fiber and to dip out the water. The night was very long, longer than the night before. Twice I dozed, kneeling there in the canoe, though I was more afraid than I had ever been. But the morning broke clear, and in front of me lay the dim line of the island, like a great fish sunning itself on the sea. I reached out before the sun was high, the sand spit and its tides that bore me into the shore. My legs were stiff from kneeling, and as the canoe struck the sand, I fell when I rose to climb out. I crawled through the shallow water and up the beach, and there I lay for a long time, hugging the sand in happiness. I was too tired to think of the wild dogs. And soon, I fell asleep. Guys, that does it for the chapters we'll be reading this time. Keep in mind that there will be a quiz, so make sure you do that quiz and go back if you need to to hear anything that you might have missed. So remember, the quiz is due by Friday at 8 a.m. Thank you.